Hello, everybody. Welcome along to this session, um, Original Thinking with Suzanne uh, Daniels. Now, this is about talking YouTube original strategy, programming, and women in leadership. And I see no better example than the woman you see in front of me. But before we speak to her, I have a lovely introduction just to give you guys a little bit of a heads up if you don't already know the brilliant work that Suzanne has and continues to do. Uh, Suzanne is the global head of original content at YouTube and is responsible for leading the company's overall efforts and investments in original content, spanning strategy, development, and production of series and films. Uh, recent original shows include Karate Kid inspired drama, Cobra Kai, The Age of AI, hosted by the fabulous Robert Downey Jr., and Justin Bieber seasons. Suzanne's also across live streamed specials and a fantastic example of reacting to the situation we found ourselves in over the past few months. Uh, tribute to the graduating class of 2020, dear class of 2020 headlines by Barack and Michelle Obama. And a seasoned entertainment exec prior to YouTube, she was president of cable networks MTV, I got my training, a wonderful organization to work for, and Lifetime. She's led development on series including Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Dawson's Creek, Smallville, and Project Runway. She's pretty much been part of our lives in terms of what we've been watching for the past few years. Suzanne, how are you? I'm great. Glad to be here. Thanks for the introduction. My absolute pleasure. Um, it's kind of tricky to know where to start with you, but I guess what would be really great in terms of trying to work out how quick you have felt you've reacted to the shift, I think, that you've found ourselves in in the past, you know, six months and whether that has changed strategy and it's inspired strategy or how it's affected what you plan to do. Well, you know, it was actually really a fascinating time um, since, since the pivot, if you will, in, in March when we were all sent home for quarantine. And we, we slowly started to realize that um, everyone was sent home from, for quarantine and watch time was increasing significantly on the platform. So we work closely with the marketing department and with our partnerships department who, who oversees all of our, our YouTube creators, our fabulous YouTube creators. And we, we started talking about what could we do to um, acknowledge everyone who's staying at home and offer them something special. And um, so we, because creators are a group of people who already create content on their own from home and know what they're doing, um, we refocused a lot of our uh, content, really working with um, creators and uh, people who could pivot quickly and get content going quickly. And, uh, and we were able to uh, do a whole kind of myriad of shows and in, an in, in interesting slate and provide more original content um, this spring when people needed it and were looking for it. And that covers so many types of programming as well. You know, it's not just, you know, it's not just music, entertainment. It's about kids. It's about family. It's about education as well. It's a kind of cross the board of all those. Yeah, we work primarily, thank you for saying that. We work, we work primarily in um, uh, four arenas. We kind of focus on what makes YouTube unique. And, um, and not to repeat what you just said, but <laughs> for me, so thank you. Um, the focus tends to be on um, what we call personalities, which is YouTubers and celebrities, um, or, or really any kind of interesting dynamic um, public persona. Um, and music, uh, all kinds of music, which is your specialty, and, um, uh, and family and kids, and educational content. Yeah. It's interesting because being a, being a mom of two boys as well, and in terms of what we look for as well, and I think more so than ever, having that sort of idea that, that YouTube Originals is, is kind of coming up with ideas to, to help kids in these situation with the educational side of things, I think is really encouraging and really healthy to hear as well. And we also, you know, we're, we're really, I was really moved by um, how so many people wanted to give back. And a lot of our shows, um, most of our shows did fundraising for the World Health Organization and other really meaningful outlets that were helping people. That kind of made me proud of you, too. Yeah, 
Um, I was lucky enough to um, watch a session last year at Edinburgh in person in a big room with lots of people. And it was interesting to hear the kind of strategy this time last year. And I just wanted to ask how how quick strategy changes, you know, and how, how quick it can be that you are, you know, looking for different things or the, the business model has changed. Is it kind of, is it an annual thing or are you being really reactive to things quicker? So that's a really interesting question. Um, and, and, um, you know, it, it, it makes me want to talk about two things. One, I'll answer your question, but two, um, but two, uh, a lot of people come in and they say, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? I get that question a lot, right, as a development executive and someone who oversees content. And I don't like to answer it because, A, um, I could tell you I'm looking for a show about cats. And then the, that, that meeting leaves and the next meeting comes in and they pitch me a fabulous show about cats and I buy it. And I really don't want to buy another show about cats. And so I've sent you off on a direction thinking about cats and I, an hour later I'm, I've checked off the cat box. And, um, and, and B, I like hearing from people what they're thinking about and what their vision is and supporting that vision. and. Um, I'm looking, so I don't really know what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something I haven't heard before. Um, but also the other reason I don't like to answer that question is that strategy does change quite a bit. We, you know, I just thinking back in my own network days, you know, one minute ABC is a family, very much a family network. And then the next minute friends hits and everybody wants the next friends hit and everyone's sort of pivoting to be an 18 to 34 young adult hip network because they think that's the new thing. And we, we pivot quite a bit at YouTube too. There's a lot of strategic thinking <laughs> and sometimes I mean, overall, I think it's very healthy and good to constantly question, are you doing the right thing? What, what could you be doing better? Of course. And I work with a lot of really super smart people. But um, uh, I also think sometimes you have to see a strategy through. You have to take the time to see a strategy through. The strategy you, you came up with, you came up with for a reason. And sometimes it, people forget it takes a while to implement a strategy. Um, but that said, we, um, we made a, lo a very significant pivot um, uh, over a year ago where we decided to, uh, we were, well, when I was hired, I was hired to build an SVOD service, that subscription video on demand. Yeah. And uh, all the shows we were doing, including Cobra Kai, uh, our Karate Kid spinoff, were um, behind the paywall. And then we decided, um, you know what, that's really not the essence of YouTube. Yeah. And, um, and the essence of YouTube is, is, is accessibility in many ways and 2 billion users a day getting, you know, getting this opportunity to look at content. So we decided to have sort of a dual strategy, uh, AVOD, SVOD, AVOD being advertiser video on demand. And now all of our content runs for free um, in AVOD with ads. And if you want to subscribe to YouTube Premium, you get a fantastic music service. You get um, all of our content ad-free. You can binge our content. And you often get an ancillary content as well. So we change the strategy. But there's a, lot of, there's a lot of strategy changes at tech companies from what I understand. What's the reaction been from the audience? Has that shift been a successful thing to do? No, it's, been, it's actually been great. It's been remarkably successful. Um, and at a time when um, Fox is touting The Masked Singer, for instance, which is a show I like, as a, as a major hit with the one rating, woohoo, they got you know, over a million people to watch an episode. Um, you know, we, we're looking at 200 million views for Justin Bieber, 75 million views for Age of AI with Robert Downey Jr., um, 53 million views for Instant Influencer, our, our uh, makeup competition show with James Charles. The numbers have been off the charts and the response has been really very positive from viewers and advertisers as well. Where would you say, you know, it's interesting you bring up a kind of a network channel like Fox. Where would you say you position yourself and who are, you know, your competitors? When you think about traditional media or streaming you know, streaming services. Who are your kind of direct competitors and where do you kind of position yourself? 
Well, it's a really interesting time, Edith, and there's never been more content available to stream and watch than that, that, I, that I can remember, and I've been, I've been doing this a long time, even though I look so young. You it's look hard young. to imagine. It's hard to imagine, right? But, um, uh, uh, it, you know, it's kind of crazy, and I, and I love it. As someone who, like, gobbles up a lot of programming and watches a lot and is a fan of they're all different kinds of genres, I, I love all, all the um, optionality. But, um, uh, but I, well, how do I think about it? YouTube's so unique. It's really the most, you know, unique place I've, I've ever worked, and I've been at Fox and ABC and Warner Brothers and a Lifetime and MTV, as you mentioned, um, and we, because we can do all kinds of things that the networks can't do, and that's one of the things I love about working at YouTube, and that makes us so different. We have interactivity. I think people watch YouTube different than they watch broadcast and cable, um, which I which I believe my I have my own personal theory about it, which is that you're you're because you interact with YouTube because you start and stop the video because you're probably watching it on a device um, more than you're casting it in your living room. You're you're holding it closer, it's closer to you physically and you're more engaged with it. And um, uh, and so I, so it's a it's a more intimate relationship, if you will, um, which is why I think we have the success we have with creators because creators and their fans really feel like they know one another. So I don't really think about the other networks because I also don't program like I used to program. I don't think about time slots. I don't think about you know running episodes Monday night at nine. Um, or you know, uh, I, or I, I don't think about the 30-minute program and the 60-minute program and the 90-minute doc, um, which has been very freeing. And um, at first, when I first got there, a little overwhelming because there were the, the parameters I had uh, grown up with in the industry were, you know, I had to throw them out. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but it's fun too. It's fun too. It makes YouTube just an exciting place to develop content. Well, I think it's really interesting, the kind of the journey and almost the kind of, you know, the kind of people's perception of YouTube and changing that from, you know, from it being one thing to be in this, this, like you say, multifaceted platform that really doesn't have any boundaries in terms of creativity, really, you know, and I think that has that been something that's been really important to you in terms of particularly really pushing the YouTube originals and making sure that people are really aware that you're investing in stories and in people and not just on a, on a real international platform as well? Yeah, the global nature of the platform is like just incredibly amazing, really. Um, and uh, and I, 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 lo I love that because... Um, you know, I know I love uh, uh, the Great British Baking Show, and, um, and Phoebe Waller Bridge is my new heroine, um, and uh, and then I love K-pop. You know, and that's coming out of Korea, and um, and you 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 have the opportunity to um, watch all, you know all of this. Uh, you have access to all of our global original content. We do original content in seven different languages right now. Um, um, and uh, and it's been very successful all over. So the K we're working on our fourth K-pop show um, because K-pop is popular all over the world. And um, and we have a great comedy in France called Groom um, that just finished its second season and set in a hotel that's really fun. And we've done original content in uh, Germany, Japan, India, um, and, uh, in fact, I was just last night, I was meeting with the India team and, uh, we were talking about creative creator spotlights, which is a series we do on up and coming creators. Yeah. And the stories are so moving, Edith, um, you know, about the people in India who were just about destitute and created a YouTube show and, um, how it gave them a path. Um, to uh, a better life, and it's you know literally as they're pitching me these creator stories, I'm crying. Um, so so I, I love that part of I love that part of being at YouTube. 
is that an important element as well in terms of it being, you know, in terms of the productions being almost regional, but having a global, the potential for a global audience. So that you really are kind of fight, going in there to find local stories and characters and people who have interesting things to talk about and tell and support that. Yeah, and that's, you know, all my jobs before this job have actually been domestic only. So that's been like the, one of the, my favorite parts about working at YouTube over the last five years is doing exactly that. And the content we're finding in um, Europe is unbelievable. The partners we work with in the UK, um, who knew? No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> I knew. I knew before this. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little known playwright called Shakespeare that I heard of. And, um, <laughs> um, so, uh, no, there's, I mean, there's, there's phenomenal talent in the UK and we've been, we've been working with them the last five years. We've done all kinds of uh, shows and, um, and they, they've been very compelling or entertaining and I, I love doing it. There's a, we've, we've got a clip actually that we're, we're going to show in a second about, um, which I've just seen, just seen the clip of, um, for Bazinga. Yeah, so he's one of the Sidemen, and we did a show with all of the Sidemen, which was very successful. Um, and he is an uh, incredibly charming, determined young man. And this, is, uh, this clip is his story. This is a whole new chapter. This is where I can really get across what I want to do and the message that I really want to put across and really prove to people that I can do what I put my mind to. Teenage Cancer Trust have asked me to run the London Marathon and there's no other answer than yes. When I started this journey, there really was no athletic ability inside of this body. Here we go. How big is Bazinga? 103.1 kg. You sort of think, I'm unhappy. Like, this is not what I want to be like. But I knew that that was the start of becoming something better. He's inspiring in his determination and drive. It might be hard, but it's going to be worth it. Stop. It's all part of the process. You've got to trust the process. You're just so inspiring. I'd like to hear where you've come from and where you're going. That means so much to me. <laughs> if you had told me two years ago you're going to be running the London Marathon, I probably would have just said you're crazy. It's written in the stars that I will be running. The London Marathon's been postponed due to coronavirus. It's amazing that you've got so many motivating factors for you to do this. I can't let them down, let alone myself. Ethan's my whole world. A lot of people don't really know the real situation behind everything that me and my mum have been through. <sighs> you might have to stop. So that was the clip from um, Bazinga. Um, I mean, tell us a little bit about the kind of, I guess, the commissioning process of that as an example, really, in terms of how it came to you and what it was about it that, you know, or how it captured attention and to, to, to then be, you know, taken on as a YouTube original. Well, we're always talking to, um, our, our, especially our, our, what we call our top creators, and he's a top creator. We're, we're always in conversations with them um, seeing what they're up to and what they're doing. And he happened to um, mention to Luke Hyams, who, who um, runs our UK office, uh, that he wanted to run the um, London Marathon. And at the time he mentioned that, he was, let, let's just say, very far from being able to walk two blocks, much less you know, run a marathon, just really out of shape. Um, uh, and uh, so he wanted to do a show about that journey and what it would take. And um, I'm not sure he thought he could do it, but he just thought it might be fun to do a show about it, whether he could do it or not. And, uh, and then I think the journey surprised him uh, even, and, and it, it comes across incredibly authentic. And, um, and he's and he's fun to watch and go along with on this journey and what he was able to accomplish. I love I love working we're working with um, Anne Marie right now. Um, are you a fan? Yeah, she's great. She's great. She's so great. And she's I an interesting her. story because you know she's kind of come through a really. She's been grafting for a, a you know for a long time and I'm working with. Um, you know, with various bands as a lead, as a guest vocalist and kind of, you know, just basically kind of, you know, 
building her craft and finding her voice and finding out who she is sort of thing as a as an artist and a songwriter but yeah she's sassy yeah she's sassy yeah she's she's coming to her own yeah yeah so this is a fun profile of her yeah what what um what quantifies a, a top creator um, simply numbers, uh, how many viewers and how many subscribers, uh, they, they have. It's a combination of subscribers and views per video and watch time. Yeah. It was, you know, basically engagement, how, how engages an audience with, with them and are they growing their audience? And is it, I, I don't know when you kind of get to, to get to a top creator, you know, there's a journey then I think that people obviously have to go on and build that audience to to capture the attention, whatever that is. But is that something that you're still really, really kind of, uh, is really important to you, you know, to make sure that you're on that grassroots level as opposed to just, you know, the people who've already kind of got the audience, got the numbers? Oh, absolutely. This Creator Spotlight series that I mentioned to you that uh, we do it all over the world, but I was, I was um, looking at creators uh, at, in India, they were all, none of them were top tier creators. Uh, the Creator Spotlight series is, is basically exactly what you're talking about, Edith. It's uh, focusing on up and coming, um, mid tier. So we see, I would call them mid tier uh, creators, creators where we see that there's some traction and then we're going to, we're going to help it. We're going to help them along the way. Yeah. I am. Um... I had a really brilliant experience personally last week. I was filming with YouTube here in London for This Is My YouTube. And um, I was so I was so proud that it was quite obvious from sitting in front of the cameras and looking behind the cameras that someone had made an effort. Someone had really made an effort to listen and to address the balance of representation to the crew, to everybody who was working on that show. And it was so brilliant, brilliant to see. Is that something that's really important to you, to be reacting to, to social change or to discourse, to really address, help address things that are, that are important? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I'm glad you had that experience um, because we do think a lot about it. And um, not to sound defensive, but I would like to say that we've thought about it for a long time. We have thought about it uh, in recent times as a reaction to protests. Yeah. Uh, we've been working for a long time um, to diversify casts and uh, um, talent in front of the camera and behind the camera. And it's something um, that I've tried to do my entire career. Um, uh, and, um, and whether that's um, black voices or highlighting Latino voices or uh, LGBTQ or promoting women. And that's been a big thing of mine to, to try and get more female directors on shows. Um, and, you know, you think it, you think, you think it's easy. Like you think to yourself, well, people just didn't think about it, but once they think about it, they'll do it. No, you actually, actually have to make a concerted effort and push harder than you might imagine. And to, and dare I say, you have to mandate to sometimes get it done. And that's an unfortunate truth. Um, but, uh, we push a lot. Um, being a woman in a, in a wonderful, you know, executive position, it'd be really interesting to hear a little bit about your journey and, you know, how, how easy or difficult that was, you know, and also being now in that position, using that position as well, like you say, to get more female directors on shows and that kind of thing. But for you personally, you know, in that journey to get into to this position. And there's not, you know, there's, there's not enough in my experience. There's, you know, there's the, the representation still needs to be adjusted at that, that kind of top tier level sort of thing. But, but what about your story, Suzanne? I was born in a small town. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have enough time for my fascinating story. That's a whole other Edith Suzanne conversation. Um, but uh, just talking about female leadership, I mean, 
First of all, I work at a company with a phenomenal female leader, Susan Majewski is CEO. And when I found out she had five kids, uh, I was like, hallelujah, amen. I have a boss who is a working woman CEO with five kids. That's fantastic. I, I've been, I, first time, I have four kids. And, um, and I know it's not easy. And, um, uh, and it's something that was important to me to have a big family. And it's been, t it's been, you know, it's hard for anybody. It's hard to be a good, feel like you're trying to be a good parent and you're trying to be a good executive and you're trying to be all that. And, uh, sounds like a cliche, but it, it is just, you know, what you're up against. And so it's very inspiring to have Susan, uh, and who's a, just a great leader to have that as a, a, a boss and a mentor is amazing. Um, the, the, there's a female head of um, YouTube Europe, Cecile Frocutaz, who's a, who's phenomenal. And, um, so everywhere you look at YouTube, the head of marketing for YouTube, Danielle T is a, you know, firecracker and really talented. So there, there's a lot, one of the great things about working at YouTube is working with all these tremendous um, women. And um, again, in front of the camera, like Anne Marie, and behind the camera, just a lot of strong voices. Um, and I haven't had that a lot in my career. But luckily, I have had um, male mentors who've been very supportive. And, um, you know, I, uh, I, I've told this anecdote before, but. Um, I did a show with Dick Wolf when I was at um, what is now the CW. And uh, Dick Wolf, of course, is a phenomenally successful producer, Law and Order, uh, many, many series. We did this show called DC, uh, set in Washington, DC, this young ensemble show. And years later, I bumped into him at Williams Sonoma at a store on a weekend. And he said to me, What's different about you? Oh, you're not pregnant. That's what it is. You're not pregnant. And I realized the time I'd worked with him, I'd had three kids in a row at, at, at working at, at Warner Brothers. And um, I was just basically pregnant the whole time to him. I was that pregnant lady development executive. Um, it's like dead in that time. <laughs> but, um, uh, but my boss at, at Warner Brothers, Jamie Kellner, was really supportive and made it work for me in my schedule to have kids. And, uh, you know, I don't know whether I could have had the career I've had without his support. So I've, I've been lucky to have supportive male mentors, too. Yeah, I think it's got to be an inclusive conversation as opposed to an exclusive conversation. Otherwise, things won't change. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, you know what I counsel women to? There's no good time. They, women are always saying to me, like, what, when, like, you young women, when I talk to young female executives, like, when should I have a baby? And I, it just, there is no right time. You can't time it. You can't time it biologically. You can't time it, you know, uh, it, it, you know, in, in, any, in any way, shape, or form. And, I, and I, so I just say, live your life, you know? It's a good motto. I like it. There's, um, there's a lot of people who are going to be watching uh, this today who are, you know, they want to pitch to you. They have ideas. They want to, they, they want YouTube originals to pick up. What is, talk us through the commissioning process. What, what is the process? I love that word commission. That's, that's a, a European word. They okay. use that. Yes. We don't talk about commissioning talent in the U S but I, I know that's the phrase and I, and I like it. I, there's something sort of more, um, uh, formal and intelligent about it. We just call it pitching or buying or, um, yeah. but commission's better. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, uh, well, as I said, I, you know, I talked a little bit about this when I was answering another question. Um, I don't, I don't like to say what I'm looking for. Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, but I have talked about the um, you know how we like to align YouTube likes to align YouTube originals likes to align with the broader agenda of YouTube and um, and the the elements of YouTube that are, are make it what it is and make it unique and so we talked about educational and, and family and uh, music and personalities um, so that gives people some guidance. Um, but then after that, 
you know, what I'm looking for is um, something that makes me uncomfortable. You know, when, when, when Katy Perry came in and said, I want to do a Truman show, like five day live event where there's cameras in every room, uh, including watching me sleep. It made me very uncomfortable. I was like, is five days of Katy Perry too many days of Katy Perry? I don't know. <laughs> but and I, and I said to her, maybe three days of Katy Perry? And she was like, no, no, no. She had a very strong vision. Had to be five days. She wanted it to unravel and people start to talk about it and tune in. And have you checked this thing out? What's going on? And, um, and I always think it's a good sign when I'm uncomfortable. Um, because that means people are testing boundaries and trying something new. And, um, and, and again, I've been able to work on content at YouTube that I could not do at, at other shows, interactive shows like The Heist with Mikey, Marky Plyer, um, uh, you know, live action show Mr. Beast Creator Games. Um, uh, so, um, I, I, I think I think I would advise people to think about what they can do differently using the platform, using YouTube strengths, and um, within those buckets I talked about. That's my general guidance. And it's it's not all about celebrity. It's not all about you know your Justin Bieber's and your Katy Perry, is it? No, of course not. Uh, it's about creators. Um, it's about tapping into zeitgeist. Is that an overused word? Um, resonating um, with the audiences. I was very proud of a show we did in June called Dear Class of 2020. And that didn't start out, you know, development's an interesting process because that just started out as a, when, we, when we started it, we, we thought we'd do a one hour show um, with a couple of uh, commencement speakers uh, talking to kids who weren't gonna get the opportunity to to graduate, have a graduation, um, which is a rite of passage all over the world. And, um, and we thought, let's, let's acknowledge that. Let's mark that with like a nice one hour show. And what happened was, well, once we got um, Barack and Michelle Obama involved, and then Michelle Obama reached out to Beyonce. And, and once we announced that, the, the outpouring from the community of people who wanted to be involved, who called us and said, "Can I say something?" And you know, I'd like to, um, I, I'd like to give a speech. I'd like to say a few words. I'd like to be involved. I'd like to sing a song. It was so amazing. And the next thing we knew, we had like, we didn't want to say no, and we had a four-hour incredible, powerful event that was more than just a graduation event. It was like, it was like marking a time in the world. And um, it ended up being a really beautiful thing. I think more so than ever now, particularly, you know, what we've all been going through since March is those ideas of the community. And unifying people is such uh, an important thing. And I think people are really kind of craving that sort of feeling through, through content. Yeah, I agree. One thing I wanted to touch about before we run out of time, I've just been reminded of the time, is, you know, I, I think that, listen, I learn from my mistakes. I learn from challenges, you know, when things don't always go right. Since you've been at YouTube, what has been the biggest challenge that you think you've learned from, that you've overcome since being there? That is a really good question. Uh, first of all, I'm always saying I learned the hard way. Why do I have to learn the hard way? <laughs> That's where you are. You never do it again, then. Is it? Is it? Sometimes it doesn't feel like it is. <laughs> I'm sick of learning the hard way. <laughs> I want someone to pave the path. Um, uh, what has been the biggest challenge? Um, well, you know, uh, I have that. I think the honest answer is that um, I've been a... Uh, programming media executive for media companies before this. And then now I'm a programming media executive in a tech company. And, um, uh, and that, that was an interesting challenge because um, when you're a programming uh, executive at a media company, you are the sun and the moon for that company. <laughs> Right, because it's all about content. 
But at YouTube, it's about a lot of different things. At Google, it's about a lot of different things, as it should be. Um, and uh, they have a lot of amazing things going on. And so um, I had to make like this, this psychic adjustment, if you will, to, um, to being a spoke on a wheel. And um, I, I think we're, a, we're an important spoke and a respected spoke, and we get a lot of support cross-functionally, and we offer support cross-functionally as well as a two-way street. Um, but that was, for me, that was like getting used to that adjustment. Five years later, I'm, I'm happily adjusted. <laughs> Glad to see it. Well, I love that you still have Buffy over your left shoulder. She's still keeping an eye on you. That's good. She's still keeping an eye on me. Yeah, I loved that show. Yeah, oh, me too. Um, we've run out of time, Suzanne. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, it's a pleasure talking to you. You too. It was a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, thank you so much for your time and thanks to everybody watching and hopefully you're going to enjoy loads more from this fabulous virtual Edinburgh TV festival. Suzanne, take care. Well, well. Have fun at the festival. Thank you very much. Um, great to meet you. Take care. Bye.